Hey everyone, welcome to the combat episode of the How to Play 7th Edition Call of Cthulhu series. I am CJ, your tabletop RPG blankety blank. In this episode, I will cover mostly melee combat rules. Remember to use the episode timestamps for your convenience, and I will leave the firearm rules for the next episode because it is really its own thing. In the previous episodes, I covered the basic rules, characteristics, and skills. In this episode, we will be making a lot of combat-related skill rolls. Basically, the lower you roll, the better is your result. But if you need a refresher on how skill rolls work, you can go back and rewatch the previous episode through the series playlist, link in the description below. So with that said, let's just jump into the madness. Unlike some other tabletop RPGs, combat in Call of Cthulhu is mostly run in the theater of the mind, which means that it is played out mostly in our imagination rather than represented by miniatures and pieces on a tactical grid. Combat can be very lethal, and anyone could be taken out in a flash, so it is best avoided unless completely necessary. However, in most scenarios, there is usually at least one combat scene or two, so you better learn how to fight if you want to live long enough to lose all your sanity. Alright, I am going to demonstrate how combat works by using the investigators you are already familiar with. You can find that investigator sheet in the description below if you want to reference them along with this video. After obtaining the ledger containing clandestine transactions between the local mobs and the nameless cultists, Lucille and her uncle Phineas reach a roadblock in their investigation. They were unable to understand the significance of the traffic artifacts in the ledger, so Phineas decided to seek out the help of his old friend Rosalind. Since the death of her husband, Rosalind had retreated to a secluded villa in the countryside. By the time Lucille and the others reached their destination, it was already nighttime. By coincidence, Lucille spotted a weird masked man in the villa, and judging by his appearance, she is utterly convinced that he is evil. When was the last time a dagger-wielding masked man came to your home just to borrow sugar? So she decided to enact some preemptive justice by getting Scott to sneak up on the man and launch a surprise attack. Scott's stealth skill is only 20, but he luckily rolled under it and succeeded. In rare circumstances, before combat starts, you may be able to surprise your enemy and land a free hit. When using simple or improvised weapons, like his trusty cricket bat, he would have to use his fighting brawl skill to hit his opponent. His skill is 70. Normally, he would have to roll 70 or under to succeed and hit his opponent. But when an enemy is surprised and not defending himself, the attack would succeed as long as it is not fumble. Once your attack lands, you get to roll your attack's damage dice. The Crooked Bat's damage is 1d8 plus the Investigator's damage bonus. The damage bonus and build are derived from Scott's strength and size. I will elaborate more on this on the character creation episode, but for now, let's just roll his damage dice. Oh no, he rolled poorly and dealt only 2 damage. Upon realizing that he was under attack, the cultist called out to his cohorts and combat properly starts. Combat in Call of Cthulhu is turn-based, and deciding who gets to go first is very easy. You just compare all the participants' dexterity, and the higher it is, the earlier they get to take their turn. Lucille's dexterity is the highest here so she gets to go first. In cases where you get a tie, like Scott and Phineas, you compare their main combat skills. This is going to be a melee, and Scott has a higher fighting brawl skill, so he gets to go before Phineas. On their turn, investigators can choose to take one from the following types of actions. Attack, fighting maneuver, run, which is always a valid option, other actions, and casting spells. Spells are very dangerous and uncommon in Call of Cthulhu, so don't get too excited about this until you watch the Spells and Grimoire episode. Also, because this is not a tactical game, movement is not a factor in combat. It is included as part of your action. Lucille wants to attack a cultist, but she is unarmed. Call of Cthulhu encourages players to interact with the environment they are in. There is a sword hanging on the wall, and there is a kitchen right behind her where she can easily find a kitchen knife so she can easily pick them up and use either of them as weapon. Oh, but she knew that the big sword on the wall is a trap. You need a different fighting skill to use a sword and she doesn't have any training in it, so she would have to use the base skill number for sword fighting, which is 20. There are many different fighting skills in the book, 
with one for axes, one for spears, others, and even chainsaws. But for any simple weapons like bats, knives, and other improvised weapons, you can just use the fighting brawl skill. The keeper can give the improvised weapon damage dice according to their approximate category in their weapons list. I would consider a kitchen knife to be a medium knife, so it would deal 1d4 plus 2 plus damage bonus worth of damage. But Lucille wants a large knife, a massive cleaver. I thought I was already quite generous with a medium knife, but apparently she wants more. Okay Lucille, if you want a large knife, you have to succeed your luck roll. And you fail. So you get a butter knife. It is a small knife. You should be thankful that I even consider it a weapon. Stop looking at me, Lucille. Your enemies are behind you. Get back in there. Your turn is already taking too long. Lucille attacks Cultus A. The target of the attack gets the option to fight back, dodge, or do nothing. He decided to fight back and got a normal success. But in the event of a tie while fighting back, the defender gets lower priority and Lucille lands her hit. She deals her damage dice plus her damage bonus of minus one. And she does a total of one damage. Rosalind's turn. She doesn't have any fighting skills. So rather than becoming a distraction, she wisely flees the combat. As long as there is an escape route and you are not restrained, you can always flee. Now it is the Cultus's turn. Cultus A attacks Lucille. When attacked, investigators can also choose to fight back, dodge or do nothing. She is pretty good at dodging, so she does that. To successfully dodge, all you need to do is to get the same level of success as your attacker, or better. If you tie, you are still successful. Cultus B attacks Scott. Scott chooses to fight back and attack the cultist. When fighting back, the defender gets lower priority, so Scott has to get one level of success better than his attacker to succeed. Scott rolled an extreme success, which beats the cultist's hard success, so he gets to damage the cultist and takes no damage for himself. Cultus C also attacks Scott but he gets to do it with one bonus die because of the outnumbered rule. After a character has dodged or fought back, every subsequent attack against that character is made with a bonus die. Luckily, the bonus die is not cumulative, but it still spells trouble for Scott because he receives seven points of damage, which is half of his maximum hit points. When a single attack deals half or over half a character's hit points, he receives a major wound, is knocked prone, and has to make constitution roll. If he fails that, he would be knocked unconscious. Luckily, Scott succeeded and it is now his turn. He attacks the cultist and scored an extreme success over his opponent's hard success. When you land a hit with extreme success while attacking on your own turn, you get to deliver extreme damage. Since Scott uses a blunt weapon, he does his maximum possible damage roll. 8 plus 4 from his damage bonus, so 12 damage. When an investigator or an enemy receives damage equal to or more than their maximum hit points, they will die instantly. On his turn, Phineas grabs a knife from the kitchen and attacks the cultist. He also gets an extreme success and does extreme damage. But since he is using a sharp weapon, he does extreme impale damage. Like blunt weapon, he does the maximum damage, but in addition, he gets to roll his weapon damage again. With a total of 10, he also kills the cultist outright. And that is the end of the first combat round. There is no set time frame for combat rounds. It could take 10 seconds or a few minutes per round. It is up to the keeper to decide what time frame is dramatic for the combat. Round 2, back to the top and it is Lucille's turn again. Being obviously outnumbered and outmatched, the cultist looks like he's about to flee. To prevent him escaping on his turn, Lucille is going to restrain him. And she can do that by making a fighting maneuver. Fighting maneuver uses the fighting brawl skill. It is treated like an attack, but instead of dealing damage, you get to apply an improvised effect, like grabbing, tripping, disarming, or shoving someone off a bridge. But unfortunately, Lucille's build is one size smaller than her target, so she makes her maneuver with a penalty die. If she is two sizes smaller, she would do it with two penalty dice, and she cannot do a maneuver when she is three sizes smaller. The cultist is fighting back with his own maneuver, but unfortunately for him, being larger doesn't give him any bonuses. Lucille wins the role, and he is now restrained. On his turn, the cultist has to succeed his own fighting maneuver to break away, but Lucille dodged it, and he remained restrained. Now it is Scott's turn. Since the cultist is restrained and has already fought back, Scott gets to attack with two bonus dice. He dealt only five damage, but since that is half the cultist's hit points, he caused a major wound. The cultist failed his constitution roll, and he is now unconscious. 
And that is the end of the combat, for now at least. But currently, Scott has a major wound. You have one in-game hour to apply first aid on him, and one in-game day to apply medicine. Succeeding first aid roll recovers one hit points. Medicine recovers 1d3 worth of hit points, but takes an hour to apply. You can only receive first aid and medicine once after every instance you take damage. Major wound is recovered when the investigator recovers to half his maximum hit points or above. There are other recovery rules of course, but I will leave those for the improvements and recovery episode. While they were tending to Scott's wound, they heard a ghastly gurgle coming from outside. Sensing danger, they immediately rushed out to intercept it. Before them stood a shambling shroud of a man, a blasphemous effigy of foul flesh, a ghoul. Confronted by this horror, all the investigators present has to make a sanity roll. They all fail. Those who saw a ghoul and failed their sanity roll loses 1d6 of sanity points. Lucille lost 3, Scott 6, and Phineas 5 points. Those who lost 5 points or above in one instance has to roll their intelligence. Those who failed can remain blissfully unaware of the true nature of the horror, but Phineas succeeded. And it is bad for him because he will suffer a bout of madness. So he will roll a d10 to determine how the madness will manifest and another d10 to know how long it will affect him. The keeper will refer to the madness chart in the book and he will tell you how your investigator is affected. With this result, Phineas lost control of his legs and he is going to be affected by it for 6 combat rounds. He is as good as useless in this fight. Combat starts. Round 1. The ghoul is faster than Lucille and he could attack 3 times. Lucille attacks on her turn, but due to her negative damage bonus, she dealt 0 damage. Scott attacks the ghoul. If you thought that he would get a bonus die by outnumbering the ghoul, then you are wrong. Creatures that can attack more than once per round can fight back or dodge the same number of times before the attackers get bonus die. Because a ghoul can attack 3 times, only the 4th attacker will get bonus die. But still, Scott dealt 11 hit points of damage, which is enough to cause a major wound. Normally, human enemies would have to roll constitution to stay conscious, but some keepers don't use the major wound knockout rules for monsters. Has anyone ever heard of ghouls or shogoths getting knocked unconscious? I don't think so. Phineas tried to fight, but in his condition, I ruled that he would do it with a penalty die. Round 2. It is the ghoul's turn again. He attacked Phineas twice. There is an optional rule saying that attacks on prone targets get a bonus die. I am using it just to be cruel. And the second attack on the same target also gets the outnumber bonus. Phineas is brought down to 0 hit points. Since he doesn't have a major wound, he is still alive, but unconscious. Scott on the other hand receives a massive damage. He got a major wound and is brought down to 0 hit points. He is not only unconscious, but is also dying. Scott has to roll his constitution on his turn at every round. If he fails, he will die. To stop this, he needs to be stabilized by first aid. Not wanting to let Scott die, Lucille applied first aid on him, and he gained one temporary hit point. But he still needs medical attention. If he is not brought to a hospital or have someone apply medicine successfully on him, at the end of every turn, he will have to make a constitution roll. If he fail that roll, he will restart the dying process, and first aid needs to be applied to him again. With both Scott and Phineas knocked out, the situation has become tremendously dire. To make it worse, it is now the ghoul's turn again. And it attacks Lucille. Everything seemed hopeless now. Lucille can easily choose to do nothing and accept her impending doom. If she does that, the ghoul will hit her as long as it doesn't fumble and that could be the end of her. But no, she is not a quitter. She is going to fight back. The ghoul rolled a hard success. She rolled a normal success. Obviously not enough to win the roll. But don't forget, she still has her luck points. So she spent a chunk of it to turn her role into extreme success and delivered a magnificent turnabout. And with it, she got that sucker. Lucille proceeded to successfully apply first aid on Phineas, bringing him back to consciousness. And in turn, he applied his medicine skill on Scott to stop him dying. The party lives! And that, my friends, is how you do hair-raising combat in Call of Cthulhu. So remember to subscribe for the firearm episode and remember that you can buy the rule books and the series merchandise through the affiliate links below. CJ, over and out.